Hi, my name is Charles Ducey. I am a PhD student in the Germanic Studies Department, and I am reading my story called A Note on the Order of Things. Something about the way the clock ticked at the back of Miss O'Neill's fifth grade Intro to Life Sciences class was deeply unsettling. For one, the second's hand didn't move with the same speed at the top of the clock as it did at the bottom. The thing just didn't see fit to follow the rules. Did it think it was somehow more liberated than all the other clocks dancing to the beat of its own drum? Good grief. Only Jeremy Schwartz seemed to be aware of this malfunction. He sat at the back of Miss O'Neill's class, taking his notes, as he had been taught to do, on the orderly light blue lines of a College Rule 60 sheet notebook which his mother had bought on discount at Target when he, the noble son, had spotted the super price back-to-school sign in aisle 16. He had an eye for things like that. The lesson that day involved fight-or-flight responses in mammals native to the region where Jeremy and his 20 or so classmates attended school, played at a league baseball, and enjoyed the occasional festive barbecue, sometimes topped off with a controlled fireworks show, according to municipal provisions. Bears and bobcats, Miss O'Neill mentioned, have very different responses to stress. Jeremy wrote, Bears and bobcats have very different responses to stress. He liked the look of his handwriting. It was remarkably good. In Mr. Jackson's third grade class, Jeremy had won an award for penmanship. He always followed the outline letter rubrics very well. As the clock continued to tick, notably faster than at the half-minute mark, and Ms. O'Neill continued her lesson about local wildlife, Jeremy noticed that the window in the far back of the classroom was open. This would simply not do. The weather forecast, as Jeremy had heard on the radio that morning while eating his usual bowl of high-fiber cereal, indicated afternoon rain. He was in Ms. O'Neill's life science class on a Tuesday, so he concluded with grace, it was, indeed, afternoon. Someone would have to shut the window. But wait! Getting up from one seat without first asking the teacher's permission was a no-go as well. Drat. He would have to ask to close the window. Ms. O'Neill was, at this point, talking about throwing stones at bobcats to scare them away, whereas stones should not be thrown at bears. Jeremy wrote, Stones should be thrown not at bobcats, but at bears. Or was it the other way around? He hadn't been paying attention due to the impending danger of the open window, and that clock was absolutely getting on his nerves. Just then, Jeremy noticed that Kevin Hughes, one of the quote-unquote slow kids of the class, had seated himself not far from the window in question. This was, as a matter of fact, a violation of the seating chart, but Jeremy felt fine overlooking this minor screw-up for the time being. Maybe he could contact Kevin without interrupting the flow of class, another flagrant no-go, and thereby solve the window snafu and continue taking his truly excellent notes at the same time. On one of his colorful post-it notes, intended for homework reminders and charting the progress of his batting average, Jeremy wrote, Dear Kevin, please close the window. Sincerely, Jeremy P. Schwartz. All punctuated to a T. He looked to his left. He looked to his right. He looked back at the clock, just out of habit because it was again ticking too quickly. Amanda Sampson, whose long arms gave her a killer pitch during wiffle ball at recess, might have been able to reach all the way to Dan Riggs in the row ahead, who could then continue the chain to Kevin Hughes. But maybe a more logical path could be exploited. There was no time for such considerations. Miss O'Neill was again emphasizing the importance of proper trash disposal in bobcat territory. Without missing a beat, Jeremy tapped politely on Amanda's desk and handed the note her way, directing an instructive but by no means disruptive hand motion at the target of his parcel. Amanda shrugged, took the note in hand, and passed it to John Rush beside her, who was known for being something of a class clown. No, no, this was not anywhere near part of the plan! Not only was John Rush a liability, he was also not situated in the most direct path to good old Kevin Hughes. Paths, Miss O'Neill intoned, with the stringent authority that often falls flat on older students, should be followed at all times. Where was Jeremy's pen? 
Had he dropped it while fashioning his note, whose safe passage would be the difference between a rain-drenched classroom and a dry orderly one? How much of the lesson had he at this point missed in his selfless attempt both to sustain classroom security and refrain from infringing on the lesson? The situation was hopeless. Jeremy glanced back along the row of desks, set in the same intervals in this classroom as they had been in the classrooms of his entire desk-bound existence. John Rush had clearly not passed on the note. Moreover, John Rush was not sitting at his desk. What was going on? Jeremy heard the clock tick, tick, tick. He would have to do it. He would have to jeopardize the all-important flow of classroom instruction in order to ensure that the window was closed. Stoically, like a practiced batter poised over home plate, Jeremy raised his hand. The angle of it was fantastic. That's what a regular training schedule and a balanced breakfast will yield. Yes, Jeremy, Ms. O'Neill said. What was his question? Why did it seem just then that the clock had lost its tick, that all order had been drained from an otherwise orderly school-aged world fit for the formation of young minds? Why hadn't he thought his question through? The image before him was an astounding one. John Rush, standing atop the desk of a frightened Jane Green ahead of him, waved a bright orange post-it note in his hand. I know what he wants, Miss What's-Your-Face, John Rush said. A collective breath was drawn. Jeremy nearly squealed, but caught himself squealing being less than acceptable classroom etiquette. John Rush swiveled back in Jeremy's direction. Jeremy wants Kevin to throw his notebook out the window. What? No, no, that was certainly not what he had written. Jeremy's mind slowed to a crawl. His mouth was dry. He had no words. Then, with the swift form of a batter sprinting off to first, John Rush, vaulting from one desk to the next, kicked the notebook of one Jeremy P. Schwartz from its roost atop the stepping of the desk of our bewildered fifth grader and with an enviable athletic grace, hurled himself out the wide but by no means easily passable window into the gray skies beyond.